Pour yourself a sweet tea, pull up a lawn chair, and turn the page with us. You're listening to Right on Mississippi, a podcast taking you inside the minds of America's most treasured wordsmiths. I'm Ebony Lumumba, and Right on Mississippi is produced in partnership with Mississippi Public Broadcasting for the Mississippi Book Festival, the South's Literary Lawn Party. Welcome to this uh, virtual 2020 Mississippi Book Festival and to this panel celebrating the 50th anniversary of the University Press of Mississippi. The festival's mission to our speakers is, and I quote here, to delve into the rich legacy of the state's largest and only nonprofit publisher. Before we start, however, I would like to give some brief context about for the press. University Press of Mississippi, UPM in short, was established in 1970 as the publishing arm of the state's eight universities. Its budget was $25,000, and the press published seven books from the eight subsidized by the originating universities. Its operating budget in 2021 is projected to be $3 million, and it will publish 95 titles. The press generates about 87% of its annual revenue from the sale of its books and gets the remainder as a direct appropriation from the state's eight universities combined. UPM is one of a handful of university presses in the country to have an endowment. The press's editorial program comprises literature, history, music, popular culture, comic studies, film, photography, Caribbean studies, folklore, and regional culture. Its books reach a worldwide audience of scholars and lay readers, sometimes in translations into one of 17 languages. UPM books garner similar attention in rewards, in awards and reviews. Press authors are national, sometimes international. Its roster includes not only such Mississippi luminaries as Aurora Welty, Elizabeth Spencer, Ellen Douglas, Richard Wright, Willie Morris, William Winter, and Jack Reed, but also such icons as Toni Morrison and Stephen Ambrose. I would say that what best characterize UPM are its entrepreneurial spirit and creative energy, which allows it to remain vibrant in an ever-shifting publishing landscape. Among its whole host of initiatives, I mentioned just three. UPM boldly embraced the state and nation's rich African-American culture and emerging areas of study like folklore. It broke new ground in scholarship through its many series of interviews and pioneered in areas such as comic studies. The press's bold thinking is also evident in its adoption of evolving technologies across the publishing spectrum, editorial, design and production, marketing, and order fulfillment. In the 156 member Association of University Presses, UPM punches way above its weight. Its staff members are called on to serve the association in various capacities and do so with distinction. I encourage you all to visit the press's website and look through its catalogs for evidence of my comments and much more. It is now my pleasure to introduce our panelists who will speak in the following order. Robert Luckett, Monica Gellowat, Brian Pugh, and Anne Abbott. Robert Luckett is a professor of history and director of the Margaret Walker Center at Jackson State University. He is a specialist in Southern and civil rights history and has published extensively in these areas, even as he has worked to make history live through public programs. Among them, the annual Martin Luther King Convocation, the Four My People Awards, and the Margaret Walker Centennial Celebration in 2015. On the occasion marking the 50th anniversary of the police shootings of Philip Gibbs and James Green, Robert held a special commencement for the class of 1970 and presented honorary doctorates for Green and Gibbs to the families. These and other occasions immeasurably enrich both JSU students and community members. In 2016, Robert chaired a conference on the future of the liberal arts featured tw featuring 20 speakers of national prominence. Redefining Liberal Arts Education in the 21st Century is the book based on the proceedings and is the focus of Robert's pr presentation. 
Robert is the book's editor, in which he also had an essay, Historical Memory and the Meredith Monument at Ole Miss. Robert published Joe T. Patterson and the White South Dilemma, Evolving Resistance to Black Advancement with University Press in 2015. Jackson State University and the larger community are fortunate to have in Robert Luckett, a historian who publishes widely and whose intentional and thoughtful efforts define the subject in the most broadly beneficial ways possible. Robert, over to you. Thanks, Sita. I'm glad to be here. Thanks to the Mississippi Book Festival. I'm very sorry we can't all in person, but I am grateful to have this opportunity to uh, to be here with my um, my friends, old and new, and colleagues, and to be a part of this panel, especially uh, about the University Press in Mississippi and its remarkable history. I think I've had every kind of role and relationship with the press other than being a paid employee. Um, <laughs> I've had a long uh, uh, history uh, professionally, and really since the beginning of my professional career. The, the first real contact I had with the press came in October 2008, as a graduate student at the Southern Historical Association meeting where I was giving a, a paper based on my what was then my dissertation. And I met Craig Gill, uh, who helped from that point shepherd what was a, a dissertation eventually into a manuscript published in August of 2015, a seven year journey um, uh, towards uh, a monograph that was everything you could want in terms of, of a relationship with the press and an editor um, and, and the patience required to see a monograph go um, from, from dissertation to, to an actual book. And I was deeply uh, grateful for that from the beginning. Uh, this newest uh, publication, Redefining Liberal Arts Education in the 21st Century, was a great departure for me because it's really outside of my um, uh, entry, uh, the chapter that I have, editing that collection was well beyond the scope of my experience as a, as a historian and as a, as a civil rights historian. But I really think that, if anything, it particularly speaks to the nature of the university press of Mississippi right, and, and the importance of the work that it does, because it is not just a press for one university or one place, but it's for all of Mississippi. And it, and it speaks to the fact that the university press provides access to high-level publication for scholars in various fields across the state. This collection alone uh, features a, a dozen current faculty members at Jackson State, uh, including two um, with their own books with the press, Mario Azevedo's The State of Health and Healthcare in Mississippi, which he published with the press, which is incredibly important right now in the context of the pandemic. My colleague Tom Kirsten in Sociology, whose newest book, Where Misfits Fit, uh, is forthcoming later this year. I can't wait to, to read about um, his research uh, in the Ozarks in particular and, and social um, history in the Ozarks. Uh, my history department colleague, Lomarsh Rutnerin, his Indian Car Caribbean book, um, just the diversity of, of scholarship and scholars who have access to the press and the press's support um, for, for our work and for this work in particular, redefining liberal arts education in the 21st century. I remember approaching Craig Gill initially about it, and, and this was a unique collection, and we, he really sat down with me in his office, and we brainstormed about, well, how does this fit within the press, and, and what does it mean uh, to publish a book like this, even with the difficulty you might face in coordinating and assessing such a diverse collection, and, and ultimately, it's the collection itself is divided into multiple areas. You have a, a section on the digital humanities and technology in the liberal arts. You have a section on the arts, on writing, on pedagogy in the liberal arts, on social issues and the African American experience in the liberal arts, which does include uh, my own essay, Historical Memory and the Meredith Monument there at the University uh, of Mississippi. Uh, a depth and breadth of scholarship that falls well beyond kind of my uh, specific uh, purview um, and my, my own scholarship. But the support from the beginning um, of the press for this project 
um, was really phenomenal and, and supported me and, and lift me up as, as, as an editor trying to pull together a collection of essays, which often can be more difficult than writing your own monograph because ultimately you're at the, uh, at the will and uh, pleasure of your contributors and trying to uh, wrangle uh, their submissions and get them in and get revisions in. But from the outset, the press was dedicated to seeing this book, um, come to to fruition and come to publication. And and ultimately, I do see it as a testimony to the invaluable service and work done by the University Press of Mississippi. The the primary argument in the book is the fundamental essential nature of the study of the liberal arts, of the capacity to read and to write critically and analytically and to think critically and analytically um, for, for anything you want to pursue, not just for one career path or one professional path, but for the capacity to do anything you want to with your life. And if that's not a testimony to the press itself and what the press does, publishing the remarkable collections it's published over the years, I don't know what else is. Um, and so, uh, again, in many ways, redefining liberal arts education uh, in the 21st century, for me, is, is a testimony to the press. Um, but I see so much, um, uh, so much else in the in the work and the legacy and the history of the press um, that has been important to me professionally. Um, I went back and looked. I've been a, a peer reviewer, an outside reader for the press for 11 different manuscripts since I've gotten to, to Jackson State. I think that's a pretty good run over the last decade. I bet I'm up there with some <laughs> some other reviewers. Uh, and 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 honestly, um, they the press has always taken um, my thoughts um, and 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 concerns and ideas and support for manuscripts I've read and, and taken those ideas seriously and, and used them to bring some manuscripts to fruition and to say to others that, that they just don't fit with, uh, within the press. And, and that's always exciting for me to get to be on that end of it since I've now been through the process of publishing both a monograph um, and a collection of essays. But then there's my role as director of the Margaret Walker Center at Jackson State, which the great writer Margaret Walker Alexander founded in 1968 as a Black Studies Research Center. And now there is a, a Margaret Walker Alexander series in African American studies at the University Press of Mississippi. What a remarkable testimony that in Mississippi, a, a program that found, was founded by a Black woman, scholar, intellectual, poet, activist, author, artist, um, would bring to fruition in 1968 uh, can see its legacy enhanced by a series at the University Press of Mississippi. And since 2008, if my math is right, there have been 39 books that have been a part um, of that series. That's three books a year over the last 13 years that the Margaret Walker Alexander series has been around. And I just I, I looked at some of the, the classic books that have come out of that uh, from the very first book in October 2008, African-American religion and the civil rights movement in Arkansas, uh, to the newest contribution today, January 2022, coming out, uh, performing racial uplift, E. Azalea Hackley, an African-American activist from the postbellum to the pre-Harlem era, and so many other great ones. The speeches of Fannie Lou Hamer, the wonderful biography of Daisy Bates, the Arkansas civil rights activist, books on Richard Wright and Frank Yerby, who were colleagues and friends of Margaret Walker's. Um, I, she would be so ecstatic to see that legacy maintained. And then I think about my own scholarship and the books, uh, just reflecting on the books that have been important to me, some of which I've also appeared in as a contributor, like Ted Ormby's The Civil Rights Movement in Mississippi and the Mississippi and Encyclopedia, both of which I have um, pieces in. Books like the late John Herbert's Deep South Dispatch about his um, role as a journalist during the Civil Rights Movement, or Matt Heron's photographs, This Light of Ours, Mike O'Brien's We Shall Not Be Moved, The Jackson Woolworth Sit-In. Uh, Carter Dalton Lyons, Sanctuaries of Segregation, Charles Bolton's books, William F. Winter uh, and the New Mississippi, and The Hardest Still of All, a book about the history of the desegregation of public education in Mississippi that I reference frequently in my scholarship and, and in my work, both in the public and in the academic realm. Red Rednecks, Redeemers, and Race by Stephen Cresswell. I recently have been uh, contracted with the Public Defender's Office to work on a, an appeal case of a man who was on death row in Arizona who was convicted um, of murder, um, but grew up with 
deep family uh, trauma in the Mississippi Delta being raised in money and Sumner at the same time and the same age as Emmett Till. And Rednecks, Redeemers and Race was a, a, a source that I, I relied on looking back at. Um, Katajiri's The Mississippi State Cyber Commission, Je uh, Jeff Howell's biography of Hazel Bremen Smith, um, yeah, just so many books. And then, you know, even the classic 1996 paperback edition of Merle Evers' book, For Us, The Living. Uh, the list could just go on and on. And I think, you know, for me, the the myriad of ways in which the university press has come to impact my um, professional life um, from my own books um, that I've been able to, to work with and to bring out from uh, su supporting and supplementing my own scholarship through the Margaret Walker Alexander series, from the manuscripts I've been lucky enough to, to review and to have some small role uh, in, in, in uh, seeing come to fruition. I've been lucky in that regard, and, and I'm grateful um, for that history. I know we're getting close. Uh, we have a limited amount of time, so I'm going to stop there, and hopefully we'll have some time for, for further discussion later. Thank you, Robert, for those wonderful remarks. And I will say that one of the things that I'm proudest of, and I know the press staff is particularly proud of, is its very rich uh, list of publications in African-American studies broadly defined. And uh, I greatly appreciate your bringing attention uh, to that. And I will just say your seven-year journey from uh, manuscript to book is a uh, is relatively short, actually, given the amount of work that is involved in taking something that is relatively raw and uh, developing it into book publication. And I know that that is one of the things that the press does is to render that kind of service to authors. So, and uh, I will say that Craig Gill is the um, whom you talked about is the current. Uh, he's the director at the University Press, and I say that with pride because. Um, I hired him to the press in 1997, so that gives me uh, personal satisfaction as well. Thank you again. Um, our next speaker is uh, Monica Gellowat, who is a director of the University of Southern Mississippi's School of Humanities and a professor of English. Her areas of study are contemporary literature, visual art, and critical and aesthetic theory. She is the author of multiple articles and the monograph, in Defense of Dialogue, Reading Habermas and Postwar American Literature. Monica's particular focus of study is ekphrasis, literary commentary on visual art. While all this sounds arcane, even to someone who has worked in academic publishing for about 30 years, Monica's students and colleagues make clear that she is grounded, an effective communicator, and influential both in and outside of the classroom. Labeled a superstar teacher by colleagues, Monica is a recipient of the Faculty Senate Teaching Award. Students say that she is really good at relating to them and that everything she says is profound and eloquent and applicable to academics and everyday life. One of her students captures Monica's enthusiasm for everything she does with her comment. If there was Southern Miss in a person, it would be Dr. Gallowat. On a personal note, as someone who shares Monica's ethnicity, I find this delightfully ironic and most welcome. It is exciting for University Press that Monica accepted the invitation to be the editor for Literary Conversations, one of the most important and longstanding series that the press publishes. There is no doubt that it will evolve to further heights under her, under her stewardship. The series started with Conversations with Eudora Welty in 1984, and this is one of the most recent additions to the series, Conversations with Lorraine Hainsbury. Monica, it's all yours. Well, thank you for that very generous introduction, Sita. Um, and I do have to make one correction so that uh, my colleague doesn't get offended. I'm actually the Associate Director of the School of Humanities. I have not oh. yet usurped his authority as the director, <laughs> but I have my designs, I'm kidding. It's really nice to do this. I'm, it's, it's bittersweet though, of course, because it makes me wish that we could have been in person. And I know everyone was excited about that. So my fingers are crossed that maybe we can meet, meet in person one day. 
So it's funny because this position I have to sit in at my in my office is the only way not to have the sunlight um, affect my screen, but it also means that I can show you my huge stack of literary conversations volumes that found their way in my to, into my office because I didn't have space for them at home, but it turned out to be a happy accident because my students come in to my office and they face that stack and it's become a kind of lending library for so many students who are doing a deep dive into a particular author or have just come to find out about an author that they're just really excited about. And the series focus on interviews is just such a personal way into an author's mindset, um, as well as their passage through their career, you know, because the interviews are, are organized in a chronological way, you can really follow the development of a writer. You can see them through various personal and professional challenges and hardships and styles and movements. Um, here at the University of Southern Mississippi, we have the Center for Writers, which was started by Frederick Bartholomé in the 70s. And it's one of the most nationally well-known creative writing programs, which means that we have students from all over the country and sometimes the world. We have two international students currently who come here to study creative writing. And um, it, it was really exciting for me when I was asked to become the series editor for this because I also serve as the critic for the Center for Writers, which means I teach classes on craft and I work on dissertations with creative writers um, and those students are at a really important moment in their career. They're emerging, they're just beginning to publish. Um, they're, they're full of passion, but also anxiety about what it might mean to be a real quote, publishing writer. And I've just found that having access to these volumes has been really beneficial to the development of their craft as emerging writers. Um, for them to discover who their influences are, but also to get a window into why writers change and, and what provokes those changes and to see who the influences of those writers were. So having access to those volumes has been great. Um, as a scholar of contemporary literature, I personally have benefited from the series. My research has benefited from the series. Um, I, I always have a volume handy. I was just noticing this is the one on my desk right now, which is really exciting. Um, I've just started it, but that's just for my personal pleasure. Um, but I've done research and, and published on James Baldwin and Don DeLillo most recently. and enjoyed the use of the volumes for my own research um, as a result. So I do think that to my knowledge as a contemporary scholar, there is no other press out there that has a series like this that gives scholars a different type of look into what writers are doing. I mean, typically what we do is we read the primary source material and then we do research into critical scholarship on whatever our subject is. And if we read interviews, they're our own, it's our, our own effort to find them wherever they may be. And to have this kind of curated experience of interviews is so useful. It saves us so much time that we would spend scouring the internet for these types of interviews and to know that a conscientious volume editor has taken the time to really put this for, together for us. It always makes me feel when I use a volume like I'm covering my bases because this other person has done their due diligence. It's also really exciting for us to have living writers, in some cases who've come here to the Center for Writers to give talks, um, actually also have volumes out. And so we can share those volumes with them when they come to visit. I guess I just, I, I wanna emphasize that we have really tried in recent years to, or since I, since I started in 2015, we've really put an emphasis on diversity um, of volumes. And that is in terms of race, gender, genre, as well as age. So we have 
occasional issues out on older, very well-known people like Angela Davis or Joan Didion, which was a volume that I was personally very excited to shepherd through. But we also have had, you know, rising writers, um, more write writers who obscure uh, dramatists who are really just known to people in theater. So it's giving us a chance to expose their work to audiences who may not have known them. Um, and so those are those are some of the priorities that drive the conversations I have with the acquisitions team when we look at volumes is a how does this fit into the overall shape of the year and b who are some of the overlooked um, and underrepresented figures that we really want to make a contribution toward so I'm, I'm proud to say we've done 36 volumes since I started in 2015. That's six a year. And um, according to Mary, who looked this up for me, uh, we have six coming up next year. I just love get, getting them and seeing them from start to finish. And I'm, I'm really happy to be part of the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. And thank you so much for your endorsement of this really wonderful series, as I said, that we started in 1984, and our goal at that time was to have, to bring out the best and most representative interviews with notable modern writers. And I think you have said that that's, that, what, that is what we have done. I remember years and years ago, I was trying to get Scott Donaldson, and some of you may be familiar with his name, to do a volume on John Cheever. And he kept saying, oh, not now, not now, not now. And finally, I said, we have to get this done. And he said, you're right. There's nothing like having the person speak for himself. And I think that's what the interviews do. And having those interviews along with a, a good introduction and a chronology, they have become, I'm very happy to say, and happy to have you note that they have become a really invaluable resource to scholars and to lay readers alike. So thank you for all those good words about the literary conversations and about the work of the press. Our um, next speaker is uh, Brian Pugh, who will speak about something quite different. Brian is on the faculty of Mississippi State University's Honors College and is the director of the Stennis Center for Public Service, a federal legislative agency with offices in Starkville and Washington, DC. Prior to his present position, Brian served as an analyst for the Legislative Budget Office Director of Finance for the Office of Governor, and as both the Deputy Executive Director and Deputy Fiscal Officer for the Department of Finance and Administration, the youngest person to date to serve in these capacities. Brian's reputation in public budgeting and finance led to his being elected as a life member of the National Association of State Budget Officers, making him only the second member from Mississippi in the association's history. In his courses on civic engagement, Brian reflects his own commitment to public service and desire to influence others. Budgeting and politics are inherently fractious, but Brian, in his writing, in his work, and in his teaching, he shows how they can be successfully negotiated. Today, Brian dons the hat of author and shares his experience of working with the university press staff on his book, Chaos and Compromise, The Evolution of the Mississippi Budgeting Process. Brian, it's podium is yours. All right, thank you for that introduction. And it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. I do regret that we can't be at the Capitol. I spent a lot of years, about a decade, working as a state employee at the Capitol. And I was really looking forward to the, to the in-person book festival, but I, uh, Again, I'm still happy to be here, and I am looking forward to the, the book festival continuing in person next year, hopefully. My first time really becoming familiar with the University Press of Mississippi is um, when I served as, when I was a graduate student at the Mississippi State, at Mississippi State University, and I was a member, a student member of the Mississippi Historical Society, and I would go to the annual meetings, and Craig Gill would be at the annual conference selling books on the table from the University Press of Mississippi. And even as a young 
22, 23-year-old, I had a large collection of University Press of Mississippi books, and I started to think, wow, if I just wait until the annual conference, I can get them at like 30 or 40%. So I came quite familiar with the press then, got uh, acquainted with Greg, uh, Craig Gill, and again, the rest is kind of history. But um, I'm a big fan of the press, and I love the diversity in the authors that um, have published work in the past, and will continue in the future. My background is very different than traditional academics because I did work as a practitioner in government for a number of years. And that's one of the things that, again, I love about the press because you have your academic, academicians, you have your practitioners. One of the best, one, one of my favorite books is um, Mississippi po po um, Politics, The Struggle for Power for um, Jer Jared Nash and, and Andy Taggart, both who served as chief of staffs for, for governors and wrote about their experience. And they really use Mississippi history to explain the political process. And that's kind of what I try to do in my book as well, because uh, although a lot of even legislators who are charged with appropriating funds to, to fund all of state government, including the University of Press of Mississippi, they're not as familiar with the budget making process. And even as a budget analyst working for the legislative budget office, when I started, I did not have the, the knowledge of knowing why we did the things that the way we did it. And you would go and look for, for books on the topic and it was just really hard to find some. So that's how I decided to actually write the book. But it was a, a really unique process for me just because um, I've written articles and and um, although I'm a big fan of lots of books published by the University Press of Mississippi, I did not really get start working with the press in any capacity until oh, maybe a few years ago, whenever I was asked to review a book um, dealing with, with finance and uh, I enjoyed that process. And that's around the time too, when I was starting to think about, hey, maybe I'll, I'll write a book myself just because um, again, I'm very familiar with the topic. Um, in addition to working for the legislature, I worked for the executive branch and I was already teaching um, public finance at the university level. I was started teaching at Jackson State University while I was um, working for state government. And again, just looking back at some of the earlier writers that wrote about either politics or um, some type of policy, I knew that the press did use um, practitioners as well. So I think it was an added bonus that I just so happened to, you know, have a PhD and teach, but I really wanted to focus on the my experience as a practitioner. And I think the university press staff really was helpful with that too, because I'm not Again, your traditional academic, your tr traditional author. And I think that they were very patient with me. I think Craig was very nice about, you know, answering all the questions that I, I had. And I probably picked the worst time to publish a book because it was during a pandemic. <laughs> Whenever I was finishing up and the book actually was completed in 2020. So it was one of those situations where it was new experience, even for the University Press staff, because they were accustomed to working in a building. They had to start working remotely and you didn't have the access to the staff like you would um, if there was not a pandemic. But they made the process so much easier. And again, for my first book, I don't think that, that the process could have been any easier because of the help from the staff. So I really do appreciate that. And even trying to set things up pertaining to the book as far as um, speaking and engagements. They did help me to set things up virtually. So um, although it was not the experience that most authors get to, to um, have, I, I really enjoyed the process and, and I look forward to continuing a long relationship with the University of Press of Mississippi. So just to take up just a few minutes to talk, actually talk about the book. Um, again, it's, it's Mississippi, it, it deals with the, the evolution of the budget budgeting process. So instead of just talking about Mississippi budgeting, it's a very dry topic. And again, it's hard to get people who are involved in the process to get excited, um, excited about it. So I basically tell the story of how it came, came to be what it is today. So I talk about the policymakers, the governors, the legislative body, the 
uh, Commission of Budgeting and Accounting, the um, the the agency that um, succeeded the Commission of Budgeting and Accounting, the Legislative Budget Office, Fiscal Management Board, which was uh, replaced by the Department of Finance Administration. So I talk about the history of that. I talk about the governor's involvement who worked towards getting laws passed to, to create what we know to today as the modern day process. And I talk, I go into a lot more detail about the actual governors because people tend to know who the governor is more so than individual legislators that may chair a finance committee or ways and means or an appropriation. So we've had lots of governors who have made contributions to the process that I get a chance to talk about at length. And if I had to, you know, single out one governor to talk about who just truly had a, um, played a big role in, in uh, what the current process is and who just, I think, did a really good job, who's kind of not recognized as much as Bill Elaine. Um, I talk about when he was the attorney general uh, from 80, 1980 to 1984, and he basically sued the legislator saying that it's unconstitutional for them to serve on boards and commissions, the Commission of Budgeting and Accounting that I just referenced earlier, because they served on that commission with the governor. So you can't have legislative and executive branch combined. So he sued, eventually won the case and became governor after that in 84 to, to 88. So that's basically when they had to abolish, abolish the unconstitutional Commission of Budgeting and Accounting. And Again, he ironically uh, became the governor that had to deal with this new dynamics of what the budgeting process would be when you had um, the newly created Joint Legislative Budget Committee and Legislative Budget Office. So basically what the legislature did was they decided to, hey, we're going to take the governor off the committee and have our own committee. And we'll basically decide how fiscal policy is made in the state of Mississippi, because, again, our, our 1890 Constitution gives our legislative branch quite a bit of power. So uh, again, Elaine uh, basically said he was gonna veto the bill if they didn't allow more executive authority, which brought about the Fiscal Management Board, which eventually became the De Department of Finance Administration. So um, not to pick any favorite uh, governors or anything like that too. I do, I think a lot of the readers would probably, who's interested in fiscal policy, probably got a chance to learn about a lot of, a lot of the governors that they probably would not have learned about otherwise. But again, Bill Elaine being one of the big, one of the um, ones that contributed quite a bit. And again, I, I won't bore you too much with it, but but again, just really enjoy it, um, writing the book. And, and I'll end with this. One of the things that the University Press did that I that I really enjoyed, um, I didn't enjoy it at the time because I had to write a different chapter, but <laughs> part of the peer review process when I completed the manuscript and I actually intentionally didn't write about a, a certain topic because um, I was a senior level manager in the state government that had to deal with that. And I really didn't want to have to deal with it. But one of the, the reviewers basically said, you can't not talk about this topic. You have to really address it. And after pouting for a little bit to myself, I decided, okay, I will add a chapter on it. And I think, the book would not be what it is without that chapter. So I, I do thank uh, the people at the press who put really good reviewers in place who can provide the level of positive feedback that can just make the book better. So again, very appreciative of that. Again, didn't enjoy writing it, but it made the book so much better. And, and again, that just goes to show the level of um, people that the University Press worked with to try to make, make the books as good as possible. So with that, I will um, turn over to the to, to the next person. And again, okay. thank you for having me on this call. Thank you, Brian. And yes, sometimes the University Press does deliver medicine that doesn't go down so well, but it's uh, most of our authors have the same reaction that you do. Thank you. I didn't particularly appreciate that at the start, but I do I do appreciate that now. And I think Robert spoke to the review process as well and how it's, it's painful, but in the end, it really makes for a much better book. And you spoke to the diversity of the press list, and that is something that the press takes great pride in because we publish books for a range of audiences. And we want someone who walks into a bookstore to be able to find a university press book of interest, someone who's an academic, a scholar, and a practitioner, whatever might be your bent or your emphasis, we, might, we want to have 
books that will appeal to a wide range of audiences. So thank you for uh, mentioning that as well. It is now my pleasure to introduce Anne Abbey. Of course, it'd be my pleasure to introduce all of you, but Anne has a very special relationship with University Press, as uh, you all will see. Anne Abbey has been a force in uh, Mississippi's cultural landscape for so long and in so many ways that it's really hard to know where to land. So let me just summarize, and this is a brief summary, believe me. Anne was Associate Director of the Center for the Study of Southern Culture from 1976 to 2011, the year she retired. She coordinated the Faulkner and Yachtnabatoffer conferences for 37 years, beginning in 1974 edited the Faulkner and Yachtner Patoffer Conference volumes from 1987 to 2016 for University Press, was co-editor of the Encyclopedia of Southern Culture and the Mississippi Encyclopedia, the latter published by the press in 2017, and coordinated the Oxford Conference of the Book for 18 years, was a founding director of the Southern Foodways Alliance, and perhaps most important from my perspective, was on the board of the directors of University Press of Mississippi for 23 years. Anne Avedi has received Lifetime Achievement Awards from the Southern Foodways Alliance and from the Mississippi Institute for Arts and Letters. Over the years, attending conferences in which Anne played a leading role and working on books that she edited, I came to know of her organizational gifts, the versatility of her scholarship, her insistence on depth, breadth, and rigor in all she does. Anne joined the Press's Board of Directors in 1988, and her voice was ever understated, but authoritative, and completely respective of the Press's mission from Mississippi, Books for the World. It was my privilege to experience at first hand Anne's deft leadership. In retirement, if it can be labeled such, Anne is editing a series of books from the University of Mississippi Museum with the press. And I will tell you, when I told Anne that I was going to introduce her and she said, oh, you don't need to introduce me for two minutes. This is all you need to say about me is that I'm editing the series of books. So Anne, but I had to disobey you. 50 Years After Faulkner is a landmark volume since it is the last that Anne co-edited. She will speak today as both a UPM author and a former board member. Anne? Thank you, Sita, for the honor and privilege of joining you, Robert, Monica, and Brian on this panel celebrating the 50th anniversary of the University Press of Mississippi. My admiration of the University Press began when it was founded as a two-person operation in 1970. And as I read the two-volume history of Mississippi, the Atlas of Mississippi, and other books published during those early years. The oldest book in my collection, and the first the press published, is Mississippi Black Folklore, a research bibliography and discography by William Ferris issued by the University and College Press of Mississippi in Hattiesburg in 1971 at the retail price of $2.50. By January 1, 1974, Ann College had been dropped from the name and the place of publication was Jackson. My involvement with the press began because of William Faulkner. His writing lured me from the Carolinas to Oxford as a graduate student at the University of Mississippi in 1960, and has long attracted literary visitors from around the world to explore his hometown and the center of his mythical Yacht County. In 1974, the university sponsored its first Faulkner and Yacht conference, which has been held annually for nearly half a century. The press publishes the proceedings, and I have co-edited 37 of these volumes. With this series and numerous other works, the press has become a leading publisher of Faulkner scholarship. In 1975, The Slave Experience in America, a bicentennial perspective, brought a group of distinguished historians to the campus for a program 
that inaugurated the annual Porter L. Fortune Symposium in Southern History Series. The press has published proceedings of this highly regarded series since its beginning. Other notable press series are American Made Music, 96 titles, Children's mm -hmm. Literature Association series, 28 titles, Margaret Walker Alexander series in African American Studies, 39 titles, and Willie Morris Books and Memoir and Bi Biography, 33 titles. The Mississippi Historical Society and the Mississippi Department of Archives joined the press in publishing the Heritage of Mississippi series that includes Art in Mississippi, 1720 to 1980, Mississippi's American Indians, and six other titles. As Associate Director of the Center for the Study of Southern Culture at the University from 1976 to 2011, I worked with the press on many projects. One was Eudora Welty, A Word of Thanks, Proceedings of Three-Day Symposium with the author reading and commenting on her writing, friends and scholars talking about her work, a performance of her play, The Ponder Heart, and an exhibition of her photographs curated by Patty Carr Black. I co-edited the symposium proceedings, the press's first wealthy title. Since then, the press has produced 10 books by wealthy and 20 book books of her work on her work. Among these are The Tyrannous Eye, Welty's Criticism and Visual Work, edited by Pearl McHaney. One Writer's Garden, a magnificent study illustrated by photographer Langdon Clay. And Photographs, which Hunter Cole, longtime press marketing manager, helped compile and edit. Photographs is the press's all-time bestseller. In the 1980s, the press published the center's four-volume Mississippi Writers, Reflections of Childhood and Youth, compiled and edited by Dorothy Abbott, covering the state's big four authors, Faulkner, Welty, Wright, and Williams, as well as Shelby Foote, Richard Ford, Barry Hanna, Elizabeth Spencer, and a multitude of newer writers. The press has subsequently published individual works by and or about all these <clears throat> and many more authors. When each volume of Childhood and Youth came out, the Center and the press sponsored Mississippi Writers' Day at the Old Capitol in Jackson. These highly successful events featuring author readings and book signings were miniature previews of this century's Mississippi Book Festival that now attracts thousands of readers to programs at the New Capitol. In 1973, excuse me, 1993, the center founded the Oxford Conference for the Book with Lisa Howarth and Richard Howarth, owners of Square Books. This annual event brings together the multifarious book community to discuss works new and old, publishing, the value of libraries, and similar topics. The press's 40th anniversary was celebrated at the 2010 conference with reflections by board members Noel Polk and Peggy Whitman Prinshaw and staff John Langston, Joanne Pritchard Morris, Leela Salisbury, Sethe Srinivasan, and Steve Yates. Perhaps my most extensive and intensive work with the press began in 2003 after Sethe, realizing that Mississippians needed an encyclopedia about the state's history and culture, suggested the project of Charles Reagan Wilson, who with William Ferris had edited the Center's Encyclopedia of Southern Culture and was expanding it from one large volume to 24 books. Charles recruited Ted Ownby, Jimmy Thomas, and me to help with the project, which eventually involved 30 subject editors and more than 700 authors. 14 years later, in 2017, the Mississippi Encyclopedia appeared in a 1,451-page volume weighing 8.8 .8 pounds. Craig Gill, first as editor-in-chief and then director of the press, guided the development of the encyclopedia and helped make it available in an online version. My comments focus on literary arts, 
but the press is also a leader in other arts as well. It's 200 books on music and ethnomusicology. Ethnomusicology covers Southern American and world musical traditions and explore types from blues, fiddling, folk, and gospel to country, pop, hip hop, and jazz. The Magic Carpet and Other Stories, retold by Ellen Douglas with 24 spectacular illustrations by Walter Anderson, was the press's first venture into art publishing and resulted in a small library of books by and about Anderson and members of his family. In addition to works on numerous other individual artists, the press has published studies in Mississippi's varied artistic and architectural traditions from the beginnings 6,000 years ago to the present. I have had the pleasure of editing two recent art books with the press, one on William Eggleston, the Sumner, Mississippi native known as the father of color photography, and Meditations on the Landscape in American Art and Literature, inspired by painter William Dunlap of Matheston. Art is also a central component of the press, which throughout its history has produced books with substantial content and remarkable visual appeal, eye-catching creations that are a pleasure to hold and to read. For these qualities, thanks go to the award-winning book designers, beginning with Barney McKee in 1970 followed by John Langston as art director for more than three decades, and now with the trio of Todd Lake, Pete Halverson, and Jennifer Mixon. Working with the press was a highlight of my professional life, and I had the good fortune to serve on its board of directors from 1988 through 2011. As a board member, I learned about the press's operation the eight universities that are its sponsors, and the challenges for publishers and readers in the digital age. The press is recognized by its active participation in the American Association of University Presses and is the recipient of more than 100 prestigious awards. I am thankful for the opportunity to work with five of the, sixes, of the press's six outstanding directors who is talented, dedicated editorial, art, production, marketing, and support staff have produced more than 2,200 titles and sold more than 3 million books worldwide. My admiration has steadily, and my pride, my admiration increased steadily and my pride swelled as I watched the press expand its operation decade after decade and become one of the nation's leading academic publishers, one that reaches readers throughout the world. I congratulate the press for its half century of achievements and for making Mississippi a leader in the world of books. In an age when many publishers are cutting operations or closing, I am confident that the University Press of Mississippi will continue to thrive and will have a splendid celebration of its 100th anniversary. Thank you. And thank you so much for that splendid history of the University Press. I really appreciate it. And I know the staff will as well when they hear it. You have encapsulated in about 10 minutes the highlights of the press. We are close to our time, but we may have a few minutes for um, question or um, some comments. And I invite any one of you who would like to say something to do so. We have about, just about four minutes. My colleague here signaling to me. <laughs> I just want so, to say very briefly, if I can, Sita, that hearing these um, the, these comments from my, my colleagues here reminds me of all the other ways in which the press has impacted me. Uh, Monica, I can't believe I forgot that Margaret Walker did a conversations with Margaret Walker through the press um, with Marianne McGram that was edited. And the very first biography of Margaret Walker um, was published uh, by 
uh, the press uh, in 2014 ahead of uh, the centennial Song of My Life by Carolyn Brown. Uh, Brian, I too remember those Mississippi Historical Society meetings with Craig McGill at it and other conferences and other members of the press uh, being there. And let me tell you, when my dissertation became a book, I had to, they asked me to delete an entire chapter and write an entire new chapter, which deleting what you've written, as you all know, is just as hard as writing. <laughs> <laughs> is writing anything. Uh, and of course, Anne, I've been grateful for all you've done over the years. And I'm re reminded of a Porter Fortune Symposium I went to and attended and had a, was lucky enough to be published in a collection that came out of um, one of those so many ways in which the press impacts us. So grateful to be here and be a part of this conversation. Anyone else? Go ahead, I go enjoy ahead. hearing everyone talk. Um, I love the conversation series and we, you didn't get a chance to mention, Sipa, but you have many other conversations, not only on literature, which, of course, is the heart of my heart, but so many others. And it's really given the press quite a, a, a reputation in, in the scholarly world, but just in readers of all kinds, because you, the breadth is there. How many series do you have on conversations now? We have uh, film directors and we have comics artists and the literary conversations. Those are the three, but I will tell you, several years ago, and this was after I retired, thank you, Anne, for mentioning that I was excited to get a phone call from a woman who said that she was calling from Oxford. Because I've lived in Mississippi for 50 years, I just assumed Oxford, Mississippi, and she's talking about a time change, time uh, differential. I thought, what, what time difference could there be between Oxford and and then I realized she was calling from England. She was calling from Oxford, England. <clears throat> and she was writing a dissertation on the art of the interview and the work of the university press in uh, defining <clears throat> this, uh, uh, the art and the craft of the interviews as a whole literary genre. So that was a really nice um, conversation for me to, phone call for me to get. And uh, over and over, I will say that the, conversation series have been uh, applauded <clears throat> way back in, um, I think it was in 1988. The uh, literary conversation was only four years old at that time, but the Minneapolis Star Tribune called the series, it said, just one word, it said, it's simply superb. And <clears throat> the LA Times book review, when it did have such a thing, said that our literary conversation series excuse me, was a seductively, seductively readable guide, not just to our movie past, but to our its future. And I mentioned comics artists, that is a series area in which the press has really pioneered. And um, one of the great critics of comics studies has said that when the history of comic studies is written, great attention would be given to the University Press of Mississippi, which was in the forefront, forefront of publishing books about the comics. And I will say in kind of winding down that our editorial board has been wonderfully supportive <clears throat> of the press and of its uh, initiatives. It was somewhat unorthodox for a press to publish in comic studies and a couple of board members may have had some doubts about it, but they said, if you think that this is going to work and this idea has been vetted and thoroughly researched, we support you. So much of our success has been made possible by a board that has uh, been very receptive to our, and what I think of as our entrepreneurial energy. I want to thank the Mississippi Book Festival for so nimbly uh, adapting to this uh, virtual format. More than once have we talked about how very disappointing it is for us to meet in virtual on camera. I think we're all tired of doing it this year, but we, were, we are able to do it and we're able to bring this panel to a much, much larger audience. So I thank the Book Festival for organizing this virtual panel for its adapting and its flexibility. And above all, I thank each and every one of you for the time that you have devoted to um, 
to say something noteworthy and enduring about this institution, which I think serves the state of Mississippi and its universities admirably well and is, of course, dear to my heart. So again, thank you all very, very much. Right on Mississippi is produced in partnership with Mississippi Public Broadcasting for the Mississippi Book Festival, the South's literary lawn party.